Good evening, everyone, and hello from the Skirball Cultural Center in Los Angeles. My name is Isabel Rosenthal, and I'm the Programs Associate at the Skirball. And I want to welcome you tonight to our literary program, where we will discuss author and recipe developer Faith Kramer's new cookbook, 52 Shabbats, Friday Night Dinners Inspired by a Global Jewish Kitchen. In case um, you're not familiar with the Skirball, we are a Jewish museum and cultural center, deeply guided by the Jewish traditions to welcome the stranger, to build community, to honor memory, and to always seek learning. As it happens this month, the month of May, is National Jewish American Heritage Month. And with that tonight, we not only want to honor the culinary contributions of American Jewish communities, but also the incredible contributions by way of stories and ingredients and techniques that Jews from all around the world have contributed to our cuisine, particularly that of the weekly celebration of the Shabbat dinner. At the Skirball, there's nothing we love more than to build community and to bridge cultures by way of food. And with that, it is my honor to introduce our two guests this evening, Faith Kramer and Jake Cohen. I'll start with Faith, who is a food writer and recipe developer who concentrates on foodways, history, and customs of the Jewish diaspora. She has written hundreds of posts about Jewish communities and food, travel, and global ingredients. She is a columnist for the Jewish News of Northern California, where she writes articles on food and cooking, along with original recipes. Faith has taught numerous cooking classes. She's led walking tours that explore the economic, geographic, and political underpinnings of the food, as well as how to use international ingredients in other contexts. Faith is also a frequent contributor to other Jewish food-related projects. And on to Jay Cohn, not only a dear friend to the Skirball, but a New York City, a New York Times bestselling author and nice Jewish boy from New York City. After working in some of New York City's best restaurants and test kitchens, Jake wrote his first book, Jewish, about his love of modern Jewish cooking and baking, and which we actually did a virtual program on last year. Jake and his recipes have been featured on Food Network, Food and Wine, The Wall Street Journal, Bon Appetit, Food 52, and more, as well as making the Forbes list of 30 under 30 in 2022 for food and drink. When he's not posting holibrating videos and recipes on his social media, you can find him eating around New York City with his husband, Alex. Any questions you may have for Faith, please do put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to get to them. Um, also throughout the program, we'll drop the link to purchase Faith's book from our friends at Los Angeles based bookstore now serving. Um, and without any further ado, please welcome Faith and Jake to our program tonight. Jake, take it away. Thank you. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. I love talking about Jewish food, um, and this is such a, a gorgeous cookbook, so congratulations, Faith. I want to jump in with the first question being, what was your inspiration or what made you want to write this book? Um, well, I've been writing a column for the Jewish newspaper in San Francisco Bay Area called The J for, well, it's coming up on my bar mitzvah for almost 13 years. And the more, you know, and I kept looking deeper and deeper into what made Jewish food. And I always was writing Shabbat columns, but one day I got invited to a Shabbat dinner with a dear friend. And she, it's the, it's the cover recipe on the book, actually, her spiced, um, the spiced chicken recipe so i served chicken recipe and turned out she made the same thing for shabbat for 25 years and she never had to think about it she always had her guests bring collar bread and wine and she made a the one pan banana bread that's in the book and i was fascinated by this and i kept wondering how do other people celebrate shabbat and i started with my friends and family and i and the people i knew and then i kind of started going out into other communities and finding out well what do they do for shabbat and i combined that 
with my take on modern Jewish food, which is kind of big and bold and full of flavor. And I really believe that Jewish, the history of Jewish food is one of adaptation through time. And now we have all these wonderful ingredients, many of them with Jewish connections. Why not use them and, and, and make our food bright, bold, and fun to eat? I couldn't agree more. Tell me a little bit about the way that you broke it down. One of the things I really loved that I find not traditional when we talk about Jewish food, even though it is so seasonally based, is the fact that you broke this book down by season. Obviously, so much of our ritual celebration is broken by, um, by season. Why did you choose that through the lens of Shabbat? Well, I always knew I wanted to call this book 52 Shabbats. Um, the subtitle came later. And to me, the only way to organize that was by seasons. And the reason why for me is because of the Jewish calendar, which is a lunar solar calendar that doesn't really quite jive with the regular uh, Gregorian calendar. If you ever wonder why one year Passover is you know, well into spring and the other another year it's really early, the same with Hanukkah. It's because of the lunar solar calendar and adding leap months seven times in 19 years. Um, so I felt I wanted to talk about the calendar so I could talk about the holidays. And it just made sense since I tend to cook seasonally to organize the recipes that way. And um, then I thought, well, I want to I want to make it Shabbat. I want to make it easy for people to think about what goes with what. And I put in the 50, the 52 primary recipes each have a little menu and and it's not meant to be a dictate. This is how you have to do it, but just suggestions that go along with it. And I really trust people to know how to make steamed green beans. So I didn't necessarily give you a recipe for that. But after the 52 recipes, I do give about a dozen side dish recipes including my husband's favorite charred kale or charred greens, um, which we're more likely to have than steamed green beans, honestly. And then um, I give a dozen or so dessert recipes. And then what I call the fundamentals, which is where you'll find some of the classics of, um, of Jewish cuisine, chicken broth to make chicken soup, um, matzo balls. I, I go floater and sinker. I, I, you know, I go, I, I give both. Um, and I, uh, if, if you like a sinker, I'll tell you how to make it. If you like a floater, um, I'll tell you how to make that. I've talked to too many of my readers who say, I just, I make what I get. I have no control over it. So it made me very happy to tell them how to do that. And then I have um, spice. I think that a lot of the flavor from these recipes comes from the sauces and spice mixes. So I mm. have the recipes for those in there as well. I love it. Um, something that I really love is how focused this is on the diaspora. Um, and there's both kind of more traditional, like dishes that are coming from Middle Eastern Jewish communities, as well as this kind of new age of Jewish food. You have a, a brisket fried rice, which is kind of a play on, on uh, just the blending of Chinese and, and Jewish cultures where, um, where did you find kind of inspiration throughout the diaspora? What were some of the kind of biggest takeaways, the aha moments of spices, ingredients that you decided you wanted to absorb into your own Shabbat practice? Well, a, a, a big, big motivator was having a deadline for the J newspaper every two weeks really forces you to keep on top and to research and, and 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 by the time you'd written you know your second or third hanukkah column you go well what else what else is there for hanukkah besides what i know what what can other people tell me what can other cultures tell me so some of it comes from that research other it comes from my love of shopping international grocery stores and i'd find all these unusual ingredients and bring them home and i shop grocery stores not just in america but i'll shop them wherever i travel um, one of my one of my um, favorite places to visit was Turkey, and I took home a whole suitcase of Turkish ingredients, only to find out that my local Middle Eastern market had them all, all the mm -hmm. same brands and cheaper. So you know, <laughs> I, I just I put these foods everywhere. Um, um, so 
my some of the recipes do come from personal experience. My grandmother, um, my mother's mother, who I love dearly and really taught me to love Shabbat and Jewish holidays and Jewish traditions, was a horrible, horrible cook. We used to joke her brisket only had flavor when she burnt the onions. But she did make a few things that were really good. Among them was a, a stuffed cabbage. And I'm not much for one for on a Friday night having to fiddle and make little individual stuffed cabbage. So I turned it into a meatloaf that's wrapped in, wrapped in cabbage and has the same sauce. And um, because this Friday night, Shabbat is a holiday, it comes every Friday night, um, it's still a work day for many people. So most of the recipes have make ahead components, which comes from the feedback from my readers of the J. And then my paternal grandmother was Hungarian, Italian, Jewish. And I think because I had a grandmother like that, I was more open to the idea that there's something outside the Eastern European experience. Mm -hmm. I love it. Tell me a little bit about what your Shabbat looks like. I think it was really beautiful how you kind of talked it through in, in both a, a kind of respectful way to the religious aspects of it and also the fact that this is a, a ritual that is still celebrated by secular and religious Jews alike. So what does that look like? What does it look like in your home on Friday night? I would say there's no one way. I mean, um, that it looks sometimes it's just my husband and I sitting down and you know celebrating with each other sometimes you know pre covid especially there would be a group of people but um we were we were camping in, outside Los Angeles on a beach just a few weeks ago and it was Shabbat and I I made my uh, you know I, I put some I put some potatoes in the coals and I grilled a steak and I made the charred um vegetables in a, on the on the butane burner and i made the the eggplant dip that's a lot like baba kanush on the grill and it was and it was we didn't have candles but we had shabbat so it really depends where i am and what i'm doing and who i'm with but the nice thing about shabbat is it happens every week and what is what makes it special is our intention so paying attention and having intention is what makes Shabbat. And I really do feel that there's a wide community of Jewish practice <coughs> and that Shabbat, if you already have a Shabbat practice, I'm so happy and I'm, I'm so grateful you do. But if you are just investigating this or it's, you know, you're not looking for the traditional practice, I welcome everybody into it. I uh, well, um, one of my, one of the, organizations I follow very closely is One Table Shabbat, because I feel like they do the same thing, where they welcome everybody into Shabbat and to make Shabbat their own. Yes, and I am proud to be on their board of directors. I can't talk about One Table enough. I think that it's uh, such, you really put the, the, the key word, which is intention. And I think that that is the most important thing in this ritual and tradition is the headspace around you're entertaining it's you're putting emphasis towards hospitality um and the fact that you can do that any which way you want whether that's in, on the beach with some potatoes or or with a lavish spread white tablecloth um yeah so i, I really love that uh, i want to dive uh, in one of the things go ahead Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say one of the things I like about um, about uh, that has been really rewarding to me is the stories I hear back. I hear stories of people that are the non-Jewish partner in an interfaith marriage and how it because of the it's not just, you can use this book as a cookbook. You could use it as a learning tool or you could use it both ways because of all the stories I tell, not just about the recipes and the ingredients like pomegranate molasses and tahini or how to brisket, you know, the whole you know why chickens are important in uh jewish food to the stories about the different communities ranging from you know from the eastern european to the chinese and indian jewish communities um but uh people who are who didn't have a jewish education or are new to judaism or are trying to be supportive of someone else's Judaism, they they get this book, they get it as a gift, they give it as a gift. It's just been phenomenal, that kind of multiplier effect and the stories I hear back from people. One woman wrote me that she 
um, became a Jew by choice 20 years ago, and her mother has always struggled with a way to be a good Jewish mother, you know, coming from outside the tradition, and how could she be supportive? And now they sit down and they read the book together. I, 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 love I can't that. ask for any better accolade than that. Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing to happen. So, what is your community look like in terms of, of your specific area in California? Um, what does it look like in terms of what Jewish communities are around? What are the restaurants, ingredients, shops that uh, you're exposed to? Because I do think that people get kind of um, in their head this one idea of like the New York Ashkenazi Jewish bubble um, and not necessarily aware of the communities and how diverse they are across this country. Well, first, I am a New York Ashkenazi Jew, yeah. and I hope I don't live in a bubble, but it does influence me, of course. Um, but I live in Oakland, California, which is next to San Francisco. So it's a major metropolitan area. It has a lot of different food influences and resources. One of the things I do do is I do take, um, um, I donate them to, to, to charities. I don't do it for economic gain. Um, I do walking tours of international grocery stores. And what I like to do as I go through, like there's one walking tour I do in Berkeley that we start at a Mexican panderia bakery. We go across the street to a Spanish store. Then we go down the street to um, a Pakistani store, to a Turkish store. We hit a Persian store, an Indian store, and we wrap up at a Mexican store if I haven't exhausted them all by then. And we you know we sample foods, we talk about foods, we talk about not just how the food might be used traditionally, we talk about how it came about to be a food, you know, the economic pressures, what the geographical reasons that this food is important in the region and how and what's very important to me, how else to use this besides in the traditional manner. So, um, you know, pomegranate molasses um is a good example of an ingredient that people you know they buy it once for a recipe and they don't know how else to use it so i like to to you know give my palm ma, ma, molasses 101 on how other ways you can use it so i have an, a plethora of really great international food sources near my home we also have a um a kosher grocery store and access to a kosher bakery. So we have access to those kinds of things. And the kosher grocery store imports a lot of Israeli food. Um, I personally belong to a congregation of about 500 families in Oakland. I'm, it's one of several congregations in Oakland and many more in the Bay Area. I have been um, past president of my Hadassah chapter, and I just recently um, joined the board of my Temple Sisterhood. So. I have kids that went to Jewish camp and the one kid that went to Jewish day school and Jewish high school. So I'm plugged in some, somewhat to the food and Jewish resources. <laughs> so tell us what is your spiel on pomegranate molasses? Well, what I like to say is that well, first of all, I tell people what to look for. And you want something without artificial sweeteners, without glucose. You want something that's just pomegranate juice and sugar and maybe a little lemon juice. And then, you know, how to store it. I go through mine very quickly. But if people are going to keep it more open more than three months or four months, I tell them to keep it in the refrigerator and bring it to room temperature. And then I encourage them to taste it, to understand the lively, fruity, sweet and sour it has and what they can use it for. In the book, I use it for a pomegranate molasses brisket, which is, I just love that recipe because we take this earthy, you know, savory American Ashkenazi brisket and it just, that pomegranate sweet tart just cuts right through it with the Middle mm. Eastern, Near Eastern notes. It's just, just a perfect marriage in my mind. I use it in a pulled turkey, I use it as a drizzle on a number of things from my Middle Eastern grilled corn to my um, of my falafel crust pizza with feta and fresh herbs. And I even use it in a dessert, kind of like a strudel with raisins and almonds. And it, it makes a very um, tart, not sweet dessert that's very refreshing. I love that. What are some of your other favorite 
global ingredients that are now part of your pantry and you can't live without? Well, I'm basically on a camping trip to, from Oakland to Chicago and back through the national parks right now. And I wow. will tell you in my pantry, I if in the car, right? I have tahini, pomegranate molasses. Um, I have psyllium, which is date syrup. Mm -hmm. I have za'atar. I have oregano. I have cumin. I have a batch of my halaji, which is the Yemeni spice mix that I use in a lot of things. And I have a, in the cooler, in the, in the igloo cooler, I have a small container of zug, which is a jalapeno and cilantro hot sauce from Yemen that is the recipe in the book. And um, we use it, I use it on everything. Um, and I always take it camping. In fact, in that Shabbat on the beach camping dinner, a few weeks ago, um, I served it on top of the steak. So it's got a lot of uses. You're a wandering Jew. You're you're traversing through the desert, <laughs> and still still maintaining our traditions. Um, so something that is really really important to me is this this concept of of Shabbat and what that means in terms of gathering community and the 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 post food kind of intention. You talk about a lot of the uh, rituals and you go through how your family celebrates, which I think is super, super special. Now, what do you want people to take away from this book if they have never celebrated Shabbat before? I think I want them to understand, just like Jewish food, is it's not a monolith. There's no one way to mm. do it. And that oh, that's my personal belief. And there's many ways to do it and to bring it into your house and to celebrate it. Just like Jewish food is there's so many Jews living in so many different countries or from so many different countries with so many different ways to observe things. And we have so many different cuisines because of that. I think that's true of, of Jewish traditions around Shabbat. I'd like people to find something that they're comfortable with and that they can grow from. And if I had to recommend, you know, one practice beyond say lighting the candles or blessing their bread and wine but um i would say um the shekleanu which is the prayer just to appreciate the moment and time that you're at and that is a very very special time a prayer for my family my husband recited it at my son's wedding um we hold hands and we say it at the shabbat table we when someone comes to visit us we we say this prayer it, it's just when something incredibly great comes along our way we say this prayer so to me this is the foundational prayer of my family i love that i love that it's it's, it's beautiful i do apologize i had forgot i had something in the oven but i'll still keep talking as i pull it out um one thing that I really loved about this book is that you said just now Judaism isn't a monolith and I think the food and the recipes are very representative of just that. What um, what do you think our community needs right now? One of the things that I have found and not struggled with but has certainly discussed is this idea kind of like your friend that you, you, you talked about where they make the same thing every Shabbat and they have in their head this idea, very in a fiddler sense of tradition. Um, what is the way to kind of get global Judaism in the forefront? What is the way to get people thinking about Jewish communities outside of their own? Well, I think food is a great analogy because especially in this book, when I talk about food from, say, Yemen, I also talk about the Jews of Yemen and their experience. When I talk about the, you know, I have uh, some some recipes based on um, Indian Jewish recipes and I talk about the Jews of India and what their experience has been. So I think that food can be a conversation that way. Um, but more than that, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with people like having these established menus. I just think that maybe they're missing the opportunity to um, to 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 add something to it. So if you always make you know chicken soup with matzo balls and a chicken dish and a challah, 
maybe change one of those things. You know, you don't have to change everything. And then you it's a conversation starter and you can have a conversation starter. I think the other way to do is to look for um, books and prayers and, and other resources um, that um, that expose what other types of Jews do. For example, um, um, the Jews of, and I'm gonna lose the name, where, where was I thinking? I apologize, I can't remember the name of the, the Jewish group, but there's one Jewish group that um, that they, they bless fruit in, in between their fruit and their wine, their, their bread and their wine, they bless fruit, and that's very important to them. So you bring in a tradition like that, um, and um, food in Judaism is all about symbolism. It's a way of us to connect with a higher authority, with God. It's a way for us to express our wishes and desires. It's a way for us to show our aspirations. So I, I just think that the Shabbat table is another great place to do that. Amazing. I love that. What was this process like? Obviously, you're doing this column every two weeks. What was it like to kind of go into such a bigger project like a cookbook well um <laughs> you should talk to my editor about that because i think i turned in close to like a 500 page manuscript because i was so excited not to have a 600 word limit yes. so there was actually a lot of editing. <laughs> there was actually a lot of editing down but it was wonderful to be able to take the things I have to do in 600 words and really expand them on it like if I do a you know I can hold someone's hand tell them how to select a brisket how to cook a brisket which as you know is tenderness not time and how to slice a brisket against the grain so it will succeed for them I had time to tell them the difference between sneaker sinkers and floaters in their matzo balls I had time to tell the story about how Jews came to India and what um and and about the spice trade and how it affected Judaism around the world which I never had in my in my column the column, however, it, it just kept pushing me and pushing me and pushing me to find new ways to uh, explore Jewish food. And I was an international food writer before I became a Jewish food writer. So it really was a, a great marriage for me. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the kind of best part about Judaism is how international it is. What is um, what are the recipes from the book? One of the things that I get asked a lot, and also it's just the, the reality of it, is that there are not favorites, but recipes that are probably more frequent in my rotation. So what are the things Definitely. in your book, especially that you're on, on this road trip, what are the things that you find, what are the recipes that you find that you keep coming back to? Well, you know, somewhat it's seasonal and somewhat it depends, you know, I just get into it. Um, the um, layer chicken and rice plov, which is a Central Asian dish, and it can, it's, it's definitely a legacy of the spice trade. And it's this wonderful dish where you cook the onions and you cook the carrots and you put in the chicken and you layer in other vegetables and has lots and lots of dill or cilantro or you could use mm. parsley if you want and then when it's all it all cooks with this saffron rice and then when you're ready you have to plop it out and um plopping that out on live tv ones that would that was a trick but it may it, but it's one of my favorite things to make it's when it's just my husband and i we have leftovers for weeks or we actually will freeze the leftovers and we'll have it during our first week of a camping trip um, but it's a great party food and Shabbat dinner food, of course. So that that's been in the rotation a lot. Um, the mini mango cardamom cheesecakes. Um, whenever I go to anybody's for dinner, they ask for me to bring those. So I've been making those a lot. And um, and uh, you know, so the and the charred eggplant dip I make all the time, which is my version of baba kanush, and I give all these different variations. I'm going to be um, teaching a cooking class in Texas. So there I'm going to do it with roasted tomato and roasted jalapeno because I thought they would like a little bit of the the, um, the Mexican flavoring in that. And I'd say the challah. I make the challah all the time. Good. I mean, that's the most important thing. I think that, that baking challah has become like one of my favorite meditations is never something I really did on a weekly basis before the pandemic. And now I think it is, I, I couldn't imagine a week without doing it. Um, what are your guidelines for a perfect challah? 
Well, first of all, I don't believe in a perfect challah. I believe oh. in delicious challah. I believe in challah that's challah. I believe in challah that's there for a blessing. And I believe there's a challah for people to enjoy. But um, I don't believe in a perfect challah. I, I just do a simple three braid. I don't try to do something fancy because it's not really my strength. But I have what I think is a really good challah recipe that I've developed over over time and i will say if you don't do hala you might want to try with my recipe it's made all by hand so you can get your feet mm. you can really feel it um and it is based on recipe made by three-year-olds in my temple preschool so if three-year-olds can make this hala so can you and you know it's the recipe has evolved it's much more sophisticated than the one they make and um I, and i tell you everything you need to know in order to have you know have it come out and be your holla but um you know it started as something thrills make every friday and if they could do it i love that yeah and i think uh the, like you said the most important thing is that you have holla on the table um so yes as you're going through this is a full year 52 shabbats what is uh what's for 53? What is the next kind of project that you're looking to tackle when it comes to Jewish food? Are there, or, or I would, I would want to rephrase that because I think that there's always that like emphasis on what's next. What I want to know is like, what are the aspects of Jewish food or the projects that you want to dive into um, that you might have, that might have hit the cutting room floor from your 500 page manuscript? Um, I would say that I'm really fascinated by the food of Central Asia mm. and um, and also my and my understanding of Russian and Ukrainian food is very, very much tied up together. I'd like to spend some time kind of detangling those and understanding what because what is what is Ukrainian and what is Russian and what does it really mean when we say our relatives were from Russia because we're, it's a very imprecise thing. So Good I'd like too. to spend some time on that and um, um, I've been very fascinated by, um, I've had Shabbat dinners all around the world or a lot of places around the world. And I've been very fascinated by what, um, the Chabad houses serve, the Shabbat, Chabad centers serve. And I'd like to maybe spend some more time reaching out to ones based in far from places. My husband once went to a Shabbat dinner in Kathmandu and I go, and I know from my experience in Phnom Penh and Japan and, um, and Vietnam and elsewhere that they, they serve these meals that are sometimes based on local ingredients or it's a twist on something local. And I'd like to learn more about that. Um, and I just am continuing to taste, continuing to learn. Um, I'm very interested in the um, Indian Jewish food. Um, so I, I just keep going to keep exploring. And I'm not exactly sure where it will pop up, but it's been such an incredible experience sharing my stories and hearing other people's stories about Shabbat and Jewish food and Jewish life across the globe that I, I don't yeah, no, I'm looking forward to continuing that discussion. Oh, the concept of, of Chabad Shabbat I find fascinating. I think that's a, that's a beautiful thing to explore. My grandmother lives in Aruba and the, she we do Shabbat with the Chabad down there and I always find it fascinating how they are able to make it all happen in, in new new locations, which is very much Jew, Jewish at its core. Um, what does your process look like as you dive in and research? I think so much of this book is reflective of, of years of, of writing um, columns around Jewish communities. I would love to know, like, what did that look like from the beginning and what kind of struck your interest to dive deeper compared to international cuisine as a whole and really focusing on our community as uh, the Jewish diaspora? Well, I think a lot of it sparks um, is sparked by writing my J column and needing to come up with some new insights. And now I don't, you know, now the J column, the J column, I just, not all my recipes are developed for the J. So there's other, I'm, I'm looking for other reasons too, but that's what started it. And I would just start doing a deep dive into research and in, in cookbooks, you know, online, in um, Jewish histories. And I would look for something. I just look for a little bit like, um, 
one of the first things I, I read was um, I was doing a talk on the different foods of Hanukkah, which I called Oil They. And I was just kind of researching this. And there was just a little tidbit about a Russian Hanukkah tradition where they set flaming cubes of sugar in tea as part of the thing. And I like just went down a rabbit hole trying to find it. And I couldn't find it in time for that presentation. But eventually I did you know, did find something on it. So it's just fascinating to me. And then when I, when I, um, the first holiday I wrote about Jewish Valentine's Day, which is the 15th of Av. Um, and I, I, what did people used to do back in ancient Israel for this? Well, they made lentil cakes. So I tried to make a lentil cake that somebody would like to eat <laughs> and, you know, just experimented with it. So it, it comes from all different things. As you went through this book, what were some of your favorite, you mentioned the, the, the blessing of the fruit in between the bread and the wine. What were some of your favorite other Shabbos traditions that you've discovered in these rabbit holes uh, of researching our communities? Um, the um, the Kirite Jews really take their Shabbat very seriously and they have a whole Karait Jews are a sect of Judaism that um, 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 anything after the Torah, like the Mishnah and the, and, and and post that, are just not part of their religious tradition. Although many now worship in Sephardic temples, so they they have accepted that. And um, but the in Egypt they uh, they used to uh, the Friday itself had special customs and just getting ready for Shabbat was such a big thing and um, they had special drinks and they had special sayings they said to each other and it just it just so many Jewish communities have are in the modern diaspora and they don't exist in their original lands anymore and it just was a sweet a sweet snapshot to me of what life was like when that community was attacked. And I really, I, and when I get those little, it's like a little bit of time travel. And when I get those little bit of time travels and there's something about that I can also taste, I just get so excited. What's something, obviously they taste Shabbat very seriously. What's something that they would traditionally serve? Um, you know, I'm sorry. I can't remember the top of my head. I know yeah. their Passover foods. For Passover, for example, they would serve um, they they serve a um, grilled lamb, and they make a salad of all the bitter herbs. Which actually, that tradition became the basis for my bitter herb salad with um, which has a whole lemon dressing and pieces mm. of matzah in it. And they would make their own matzah. And um, the people from the community I talked to were very concerned that the flour they got was unguarded so it wouldn't be legitimate matzah so they made their matzah well at least this community did made their matzah with matzah meal and so um and for ashkenazi jews for example lamb in any format for the seder is is frowned on but for them the grilled lamb was a really important part of the seder celebration i love that beautiful homage um i think that that curiosity and and i mean it's something that i relate to constantly and i think we're seeing more and more jewish community has this excitement for new ingredients new stories new um traditions that even if they're not taking them into their own home it gives them this level of connect connectedness to the community at large and kind of a deeper understanding of of we are all Jews, part of a, a, a bigger community than just what we're used to or what we're known. I, I like to think that 52 Shabbats and, and your book Jewish as well, and there's several other modern Jewish cookbooks, um, broaden the tent. We're not looking to create necessarily authentic foods from communities that we are visitors in, but we're looking to take the taste of those communities and those stories and those ingredients and broaden the tent and include more people in in and just a pre, and the appreciation of all the wonderful things having a broader tent brings to everybody. I love that. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think that's the, the perfect way to put it. So as we come up to a beautiful summer, 
what are some of your favorite summer recipes that people need to be thinking? I think so much of Judaism and I, and I will, I'll, I'll preface, what Ashkenazi recipes were you, are you excited for for summer? Because I do find that, that we always think with the, this, this mentality of Ashkenazi food as like cold, rainy winter comfort. Well, um, I had an answer to you said Ashkenazi. <laughs> Um, I guess the closest thing I can come up with for you is I have um, grill, a grilled flanken recipe. For people who don't know, flanken is a cut of beef short rib where it's cross cut and you see the little pieces of bone in it as opposed to the English cut, which is a big chunky piece of meat on top of a single rib. And it's if you're not familiar with it, it's also the cut that's very often used in Korean barbecue. Mm -hmm. And um, I was in Cambodia and I had this amazing, amazing dish. And it was uh, like a beef, a, a slice of beef that had been marinated and, and grilled. And the marinade had something in it like lemongrass, ginger and peanut and lime or, or um, and um, I said, I'm going to I'm going to recreate this marinade and I'm going to make it Jewish. And I'm and I'm really was struggling with how to make it Jewish. And then I realized that a, a flanken is like the, it's like a built in kebab. And I put yeah. it on the flanken and I grill it. And it's one of my favorite things to make in summer. And my kids favorite is probably the Adana burgers. Um, instead of making Adana kebabs or patties, I make it into burgers and just grill them up. And um, of course, um, the um, Middle Eastern grilled street corn, which I slather with um, tahini sauce and um, mm. garlic, like garlic sauce and um, pomegranate molasses and jus or harassa, and if I have it, amba. I think that's one thing the next cookbook, I'm gonna have to find a way to simplify and make amba um, because it's just such a wonderful, wonderful sauce. Amba for people who don't no, it's an Iraqi Israeli fermented mango sauce. Perhaps it came from when the Iraqis settled in India and were um, exposed to chutneys and pickles, and they brought it back. And now it's in Israel, and you can't have a, a, a sabich or grilled eggplant sandwich without it. And it's just a wonderful condiment. And I kind of replicate it with a yogurt-based yellow curry sauce, but I would like to I would like to find a way to bring Amba into more homes. I think that's incredible because you it's it's one of the ingredients that are it's harder to find in the Middle Eastern uh, realm. And when I do make it, uh, which is so good, but it is a long fermentation. Yes. Um, and I think that it's a uh, it's it's a it's a labor of love, but I, I'm I'm always down for it. Um, I can get it. Um jarred in my local um kosher supermarket um and it's available online and for a short shiny moment trader joe's had it fresh but that that in my area at least it's not available anymore uh, that's beautiful we love to see that i think that they, they trickle down into places like trader joe's where you could find so many incredible ingredients spanning like zatar tahini um harissa these are all things that are just part of normalizing these global flavors in the same way that honestly I want to see like I want to see Kasha at Trader Joe's. I think that's just as important. Yeah, I'd like to do some more stuff with um, Kasha and uh, which is buckwheat groats because I think it's an underutilized um, car um, carb and protein source. So um, and I've been trying to think of something to do with it that um it kind of is a take on the scottish haggis so i have to work on that a little bit but it's a it's an amazing source it's a great tasting very ashkenazi food um you know so it's it, this whole 52 shabbats process i hit send on my copy december 17th of 2020 and it's just been an amazing journey ever since um just an amazing journey. I love that. So a quick reminder to everyone, if you have any questions, hit the Q&A and you can throw them right in and we're going to go through them. And then I guess for my last question, uh, this is a global Jewish 
cookbook um, and you're focused on this idea of going through and kind of committing to Shabbat in a beautiful way of giving people the tools um, to have a main course every week for 52 full weeks and fill a year. What are, what, what's your best advice for someone who's making Shabbat for the first time? Pick one recipe, whether it's mine or somebody else's, pick one recipe, be realistic about what you can do. And remember, mm. you know, it, it, it should be a pleasure for you, not just a chore. Um, it, sub things out. If you're using my menu, you know, or anybody else's, sub things out, you know, desserts really easy to outsource. You can buy a bag of salad. You can even buy a rotisserie chicken if that's what's going to make it to you. Shabbat's about the intention. And then you and then have discussions, sing songs, play games, interact with people. Even if if you're by yourself, I occasionally I celebrate Shabbat by myself and just lighting the candle, suddenly I feel connected to a whole community. So you know, find what works for you. I think that's such a, a beautiful one. And, to... and you know, and 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 you know, I, and some people say, oh, I only do Shabbat every now and then, but I like using it as a cookbook or I like I do it for the holidays or I do it every week. And I know people who are cooking their way through it. So there's all kinds of ways. It's a tool to use how you want. That's beautiful. Well, congratulations again. And so now we have some questions. So first one, obviously, uh, and this cookbook is available everywhere, including Canada. Um, it's available in Canada. Um, as, as far as I know, people have bought it in Canada. I don't know how they, they got it. I apologize. Um, and it's available throughout the United States and it is now, I am proud to say, available in the UK. Our first printing sold out before we could ship books to the UK. But now the second printing is in the warehouse and we do have books in the UK. And you can get them from your local book stockist in the UK from online resources and if they don't carry it ask they can get it for you. Incredible. Um, we had a really sweet note about someone who grew up in Queens uh, as did I and uh, talking about how she had a friend growing up her best friend uh, was Jewish and invited her to Shabbat and Passover and the symbolism of it. Want to know you are either if you had a recipe or if you are, um, just your thoughts on knishes. Well, um, <clears throat> if you go to um, jweekly.com and you search uh, Faith Kramer and Knish, you will come up with the article I wrote about um, Mrs. Stahl's Knishes, the famous Knishes from Brighton Beach. I had a chance to interview her granddaughters and share her potato Knish recipe. So that would be at jweekly.com, search Faith Kramer, it's Kramer with a K, and the word Knish, and, you'll, and that will pop out. And that would be my, that is the ultimate potato Knish recipe. Love, 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 love. Um, what was your favorite Shabbat you ever attended? Not cooked, but attended as a guest and that could be based on who was at the table what was the meal um i have two answers for you the first answer is the one at my friend's don's house where i had her spice rub chicken um she since told me that after 25 years she's changed the recipe but you know we have the original recipe in the book um uh, where she had the spice rub chicken and the one pan banana bread, the recipe she the recipe she served for however many years, and I got the spark of the idea for this book. The other one was the first Shabbat I had with my son and daughter-in-law in their apartment in London where they live, and mm -hmm. um, it was my you know so that was very very special. I love that. Um, and, people, I'm oh, sorry. And she has since made. Sure. Yeah, she's since made the challah and the chicken soup and matzo balls from the book. That's the, the highest honor is to have children <laughs> yeah. make, the, make the recipes, um, especially, I guess it, it, it's, it's very good given the fact that um, you, you visited, but given the fact that there is a little bit of, um, a little bit of distance and mileage in between Oakland and, and yeah. Yeah. the UK, uh, to have a little taste of home is so, so nice. A lot of people are very excited about your walking tour. 
um, and they want to oh. know how often you do it. What are the ways that they can get onto this list? Um, well, the walking tours are specific to the Oakland Berkeley area, um, and I do them as donations. Um, the next one coming up with, is already spoken to is a donation to a, um, a group that um, that provides tutoring and writing um, to disadvantaged youth. Um, so that's already spoken for. But if you are interested in finding out when the next donated tour is coming up and want to join it, I can put you on a list. I tend to do a couple a year. Um, COVID kind of slowed me down a little bit. Um, but you can always reach me at faithkramer.com. That's my website. It's cons it's under re it's it's the new website and it's being revised. It'll eventually be a repository of new recipes and sharing photos of people who make my recipes and, and things like that. But right now it has does have links to my J Weekly column and to um, some other writing I've done. And you can always reach me at faith at faithkramer.com and please put in the subject line, you know, walking tour and I will start a list and I am sure I can get uh, the walking tours are limited to six to eight people. But next time I do donate one, I'll be glad to let you know and you can contact the organization. Amazing. I love that. Um, I feel like I feel like you're really speaking to people wanting to explore your neighborhood. You're becoming the mayor of Oakland uh, when it comes to international that cuisine. No, that I, that's fair. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> Any other questions? We have a time. We have time for a couple more. If anyone's got it, just pop it into the Q and A. Um, how are you looking to? Um, so I do want to, you know, thank you, Jake. Oh, I wanted okay. to thank you, and I wanted to thank the Skirball Center, and I especially wanted to um, thank um, um, Now Serving LA, which is. Um, you know, providing the books and was, uh, you know, and, and help create this program. So I just wanted to give those all a shout out. Yeah, thank you. It was my honor, my honor. Thank, thank you both for this really informative conversation. I'm, I'm hungry. Um, <laughs> I, I wanted to thank the audience as well for tuning in um, and to encourage everyone to have a look at our website because we do have some food programs coming up um, in June and July um, live on campus. So I encourage you all to come to the Skirball. Um, we'd love to have you. I hope that Jake and Faith, you can you can come too, because um, I know you're both not Los Angeles, but um, so welcome. And um, besides our our literary food programs, we have other literary programs as well. Um, we have our sunset concerts coming up um, with global musicians. Um, people from around the world. Um, we're super excited about that. Um, this summer, it's our 25th anniversary um, for the concerts. Um, so really, everyone, thank you. Thank you again, Faith and Jake, um, for being here tonight. Um, please consider buying this book. There's so many incredible recipes um, and resources and ideas. It's, it's very, very inspiring. Um, so thanks for writing this cookbook, Faith. Um, Lahaim, um, thank you everybody. Good night. <laughs>